aspect of this battle with one of the participants was an artist. This artist, Edward Zins, did it with incredible detail. It's like you see the mountains are just as they're depicted. You know, this peak here is over there. There's the mid range of the mountains. So that will put these white ones on that rise just below us. Yeah. So what happened? The main reason why the wagon master was not afraid to give up the wagons because he had a secret, a cannon. And they rolled the cannon out and the Indians were surprised. And that helped keep them at bay for most of the day. I guess what he's hoping is to hold out long enough for the cavalry to turn it off. It, just in the nick of time, of course. And the same for them. The, the cavalry gallop in, firing and shooting, and added to the firepower of the Americans against the Apache. What do you think? I, I think we should go and have a war across the battle. Let's do it. Let's do it. Your, your feeling is that the wagons are down here somewhere on top of this rise. The Apache knew how to use the ground. They, we know that they can hide in one inch of the grass. You know? And there's plenty of dead ground all around, but you still got to come up the steep sides of this slope. It's a long shot for an arrow. You, you know, you, you, you've been vulnerable yeah. to a gunfire to shoot any, anywhere near here. Yeah. But they did use slingshots. And that also makes me wonder about this location because the slingshot gives you the, the chance to not only sh to throw a heavy, lethal rock with force from a longer range than a bow, but also you can do it from within cover. You can shoot it out from behind the cover of a bank and just keep raining them down in the hope that you'll be lucky. And there's no shortage of ammunition. Let's have a look and see see how it does, shall we? Right. Just stay in the middle, just stay. Quite a sound, Jay. Yeah, it certainly is. You can hear it. You can hear it, Jay. I mean, those stones fly. Very simple, lightweight. In this environment, an inexhaustible supply of ammunition. Under the cover of darkness, the cavalry and teamsters were able to flee back to Tucson, leaving the wagons, goods, and livestock to the Apache. The deserts in America provide some of the most beautiful landscapes to be explored. They are very diverse, though. What would people think? There are deserts on place for cactus and sand dunes. And it's true that there are deserts like that. But here, as in most places, deserts are made of rock. All those rocks make it difficult to walk in, difficult to ride a horse in, difficult to drive a car in. They're dangerous places. Amazing that the pioneers had to cross this in technology of the 1800s. State of the art technology look like the stage. In 1849, a quarter of a million men were headed west to California in the gold rush, most of them leaving their families behind. This mass migration created a need for communication across the vast continent. And in the days before railroads and telegrams, it was the stagecoach that carried the mail that kept them in touch. On these vehicles, people, post, and wealth was transported across the West. In between the relay stations, these wagons were pretty isolated, so I've been given the job of shotgun, riding shotgun for protection. Of course, vehicles like this attracted the unwanted attention of both hostile Native Americans and bandits. In the remote open spaces of the desert, you were incredibly vulnerable. Mind you, these vehicles are notoriously uncomfortable. I think I'm going to go check on my guests. They will pull up. Let's see how he's getting on. My passenger is a stagecoach specialist, historian Bob Stewart. I've heard accounts of people getting seasick in the evening. He probably could. It depends on the type of road you were on. Probably was quite fortunate. So why were these stagecoaches? Is that 
California became a state in 1850. And of course, between California and the East Coast, there was a huge bunch of land. And very few people were living in it. But California wanted to have mail service. So in the 1850s, John Waterfield got the idea to create a stage line of return mail from St. Louis to go to Los Angeles and San Francisco. The first stagecoaches established a continental trail across the country, but its route through the Rocky Mountains was impassable in the winter snows. In 1857, John Butterfield won the U.S. mail contract because his route headed south. It was open all year round. The downside was that it was too fast, 800 miles long, and took passengers through some of the most hostile deserts on Earth. The wagons basically were small and lightweight so that the horses could pull them quite easily. They were suspended between the axles on what are called through braces, which were leather looped between the axles with the body riding upon them. Now, you couldn't use steel springs because they would have broken. The coaches used out here in the rugged area had no windows, had no doors. They were basic. They would have locked out canvas coverings over the windows for the machine. They saw a small marine truck. Yes, uh, it was state of the art, though. Let's first remember that for 1860, 1850. And I don't think the passengers were pulled along the wall. The jury very, very uncomfortable. I mean, you would have been sitting elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder with the person next to you if the coast was full of nine people, which was the capacity. The seat width was 15 inches per passenger. There were three rows, and the middle row passengers dovetailed their legs into the passengers who were facing backwards. Now, 2,800 miles of dovetailed legs doesn't sound very comfortable. <laughs> on top of it, the mail was often on the floor, and your entire possessions were on your lap. So if you packed a valise or a suitcase or however you were packed, you were going to sit with that on your lap the entire time. Plus, you had to get out to help push the coast through mud, or if you were going to walk through an area that was heavily sand zone. It would be easy to bomb down a heavy coat. There were Indian attacks. Uh, certainly they were always something you had to keep in mind as, as a possibility. Uh, what you see in the Westerns, people in the cages, the new stage coaches and arrows coming in and shooting at the windows. Is that what happened? Well, I've seen a provisions list that was recommended for traveling on the Wells Fargo coaches, which ask you to bring a sharps rifle. 200 rounds of, of ammunition, enough powder, a revolver, three pounds of lead, and additional uh, uh, powder for your for your bolt revolver. So I'm going to say that was there was a reason for that. It was the Carl Bridge in the Waterfield in uh, 1861. It was very short It was two and a half years. But we started to have railroads that were connected coast to coast right soon thereafter. And that pretty much did away with long distance travel by like coach. As quickly as that started, the Butterfield, like other stage coaches, would come to an end. The Butterfield route took 25 days, but by 1890, there were six transcontinental railroads straddling the continent, cutting the journey time to just six days. Well, well, I can hear the horses are chomping at the bit, and I think they want to get moving, so I think we should make some uh, make some bucks. Oh, well, it's quite a pleasure. Very nice talking to you, yeah. Very much. Did you have your time? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's no wonder that these hot southern deserts, with scorching temperatures, hostile Indians, and no water, were not seen as places to settle by the early pioneers. 
they were just to be crossed as quickly and as safely as possible. But not even the hostile desert could deter the prospectors who in the 1860s and 70s struck off across the continent in search of silver and gold. Now this is Southern Arizona. Back in the 1800s, there would have been no buildings here at all. Not all there was here were venomous snakes, biting cactus, and very hostile Indians. But even they would have no deterrent for mining prospectors. Just over the hill here, a big silver strike was made, and this town grew up. This is one of the most famous western towns of them all, Tombstone. <laughs> One of those prospectors was a man called Ed Sheehan, a soldier in the 1870s. He took it upon himself to come up into this area and prospect. Well, all of his mates said, you're crazy, all you're going to find up there are rattlesnakes and hostile Indians. You'll end up dead. But he didn't. In fact, he found silver and struck it lucky. So he named this town Tombstone, the obvious choice. He was killed. He was killed out here in a gunfight. He was an outlaw. This is the famous Boots Hill Cemetery. How did they get? How did they get his name? Boots Hill. Yeah. Um, they died with their boots on, and uh, and all of these western towns had a boot hill, and that was just the old saying for a guy that died with his boots on. Um, that means he died violently. Never got a chance to take his boots off. He died bad. Some of these headstones are quite revealing, aren't they? Here lies George Johnson, hanged by mistake, 1882. He was right, we was wrong. 
Well, we struck him up, and now he's gone. That just shows those people have a sense of humor. They have a sense of humor. But it also dispels the, the, the myth that, uh, of the nobleness of the Wild West. It was a wild, mm -hmm. fun place. Yeah, but the, the, the death was pretty commonplace. I mean, people died of diseases, they died of injuries, of accidents. People, some of them really deserved their reputations, didn't they? Oh, yeah. This was an escape for people who didn't fit anywhere else. Thousands of men lived short, violent, and unrecorded lives. Only a few outlaws achieved the long-lasting notoriety of Jesse James, Billy the Kid, and Butch Cassidy of the Wild Bunch. The so-called Outlaw Trail was a network of trails linking safe havens for bandits, all the way from Mexico to Canada. This route enabled a safe passage for wanted men and smuggled goods. The safe havens were hideouts, tucked away in the inaccessible terrain. Many were never penetrated by law officers. On traveling north to Utah, to the Great Basin Desert, to try and find one. This is the high desert. I really like it with the beautiful terrain, soft pastel shades. But look how broken that terrain is. The very remote and sort of inaccessibility of this country would shape its history. And this would be exactly the right country for bandits and hideouts. That area over there is called Robber's Roost, and that was an almost impregnable fortress that housed one of the most famous bandit gangs, the Wild Dutch, and the Butch Cassidy. Here, it was their intimate knowledge of the geography of the region that was to give these bandits the upper hand. That is the sound of a life or death chase, an outlaw pursued by the posse. Did you know? I think they might get him. You see that scene in just about every Western movie. But what I want to know is did that really happen? Whitehead was a race for life. The outlaw making a dash across open country, pursued by a posse of local vigilantes, determined to drive them from town or worse. But if the bandit was first to reach the broken badlands, then to be home dry. A modern day high tailor, Wes Taylor, has offered to show me how. Hey, uh, Wes, you successfully called this story the beginning of the tree. Yeah, why? We got it. Don't make any more calls, right? No. So tell me, Wes, in, in all truth, did bosses ever catch up on people? Not much out here on the roof. If an outlaw can make it out here to this part of the world, he had it made and he knew it. Because once he gets off of some of these cliffs in the canyons, no boss he'd go out there at the death trap. And the outlaws had the advantage because they knew the canyons. Absolutely. They knew where they were going. The boss he knows not to go over that hill because once they get over there, one gunman can hold off 50 riders on one of these ledges. So bosses knew it, outlaws knew it, it was just a race. The local posse would generate and get a group of guys and they're getting storekeepers and farmers and the banker, you know, they're not getting hardcore cowboys to go on these posse right? They're getting the guys from town. Oh. You know, and it's kind of their civic duty, so they wish that let them go, but once they get out to a point, it's like, oh, we're done, this is it, we give it a go. George Armstrong Chapel was my third great grandfather, and he was one of the few sheriffs at the time that dared to come out here because it was in his county, so his, he had much more of a civic duty to come into it. He was the only sheriff to actually make an arrest on a robber group and bring some back out. And there wasn't even a jail built in 1895 when my grandfather was the sheriff here. So he would take him back to his tent, his house in Wyman, and he had a creamery out back of the house. And he would actually take the equipment that he had out into the greenery and uh, walk and barricade them inside the greenery where his wife and kids would take milk out there until they waited for transportation to go off to the county from the court the hearing. Probably this guy's lucky, isn't he? Taking me into the canyons of Robert's Roots. We'll pass 
part of the outdoor trail known as the Angel Trail to help me understand how the landscape protected bandits from the law. So, this is an unusual trail by American standards. This is the Angel Trail, and it ends here. How did we get across? You know, there's oh, the outlaw had a, a theory that, that you made it across the Angel Trail, across this section of the trail, that you had to have angels with you to ensure your safety in making it across the other side. What is that? Clear, slick, rock, sandstone, one misstep, and you could be 50 to 100 feet to your death. You gotta remember, some of these posse horses are, you know, a plow horse or maybe a horse they use to pull a wagon. These weren't off-road type horses. So once the posse got to some of these off-road situations, their horses just wouldn't perform. They just couldn't do it. I imagine back then, if we'd been stood here at this time of day, you wouldn't feel safe. Even knowing you well, there's dangers out here that, that are just unforeseen. And there's been a couple of times we've been riding out here and ended up into some quicksand. And that, that is like just walking along or standing like you and I are talking right now. And somebody just pull a sheet of horse right up underneath you. And it's over before you even know you're in it. And, and that's a death trap. And in the Sarah's land, it's the last thing you would expect to see. Both times that I ended up in a quicksand out here, I was I was riding a Mustang or a wild horse, and these horses seemed to instinctively know what to do in it, whereas I kind of was in a bit of a panic mode, but the Mustang started crawling to their side, and they just kind of crawled in a circle and got themselves up on their side. They knew better than to try to stand up, and they just kept crawling in a circle until they got up and solid ground, and it was, it was oppressive and inspiring to me. I did the same as I was crawling out of my belly. I've often wondered how, with a posse of lawmen on their tails, the bandits were able to disappear. But their secret was their specially trained horses and intimate knowledge of the terrain. West has offered to show me how it's done. So this is this is it. Oh my goodness, mate. You, you tell me you're going to run and go down here on the horse. Yeah, this would be you know, one of those spots that the outlaws could get to and get their horses off of, and posse horses would, would say no. Wow. I'd take my hat off to you because this isn't just steep and it's loose. It's incredibly loose. I wouldn't do it if I wasn't going to trust this horse and one that I know can handle this and is familiar with this type of training and this type of riding for. Well, yeah, you say, at the end of the day, it's in television. All right, no pressure. Uh, I'm going to step back. I'm going to watch. All right. Good luck. Good luck. Tense now. Imagine doing it after a long run, knowing your law is hot on the trail. Ancestor was chasing outlaws across these high deserts. Another pursuit 
was taking place in the far deserts of the south. The desert mountains of Arizona were a refuge for America's last Indian resistance, the great warrior bands of the Apache Nation. Since the 1840s, when the western frontier had roamed across these mountains and encountered the Apache, conflict was ever present. For over 40 years, the U.S. Army and the Apache tribes had clashed in a series of brutal battles and skirmishes over their right to the flag. Without a doubt, the most famous of all the Apache was Jerome, and he was the last of the Apache war leaders to put up a resistance, and what a resistance he left. He was a real thorn in the side of the American government, like a cactus thorn in their foot. It caused some serious embarrassment. In 1881, the U.S. Army deployed 5,000 men, and the Mexican Army a further 300 to hunt down Geronimo and his followers. By that time, there were only 34 men, women, and children in his group. Yet they managed to avoid capture for over a year. Well, a chief that followed him eventually wore down the morale of his band, and he was persuaded to surrender. That effectively ended Indian resistance of one last battle for resistance. The Indian wars were finally at an end. Just a few years later, the American government would declare the wild frontier. When the frontier rolled across the deserts of North America, it gave birth to some of the most powerful chapters of the Wild West. This is a capital city that oozes confidence. 
it was the nerve center, the command control of the western frontier as it swept across the continent in the 1800s. The very spirit of the Wild West was formed right here. In 1786, there were just 13 states in the Union, and most of the land out there to the west was still unmapped and virtually unexplored. settlers established a strip of colonies along the length of the east coast from Massachusetts in the north to Georgia in the south. But less than a hundred miles inland, the wooded slopes of the Appalachians would prove to be the first big barrier for westward migration. So there are no prizes for guessing why no. these mist-shrouded mountains get their name, the Great Smokies. Stunning, very peaceful landscape. And these mountains are part of the Appalachian Range that runs up the eastern side of North America, 1500 miles from the oldest mountains on the continent. The great age of these mountains means that they've been worn down. They're heavily clad in forestry.
try some very different routes to the second school, and that would ultimately lead to bitter clashes. But one of the first tribes the pioneers encountered, the Cherokee, was remarkably welcome. A few of their descendants still live in these mountains. One of them was tribal elder, Davy Arch. And you wish I shared your knowledge with the settlers. Yes, and a lot of what's called mountain medicine now is Cherokee medicine. That's all we had. And uh, these people wouldn't have survived if we hadn't taken care of them. This has been here all my life. When you come to a cane break by fish, you'll see a lot of little stuff outside and the bigger, more mature canes on the inside. I've asked Baby to demonstrate one of their most fascinating traditional skills. There's a few rules of thumb that I try to pass on. One is that you never take the first plant when you're looking for a resource. You always wait until you find the fourth or the seventh. And it takes about three or four years for it to mature. So we want to look for the darkest color and the straightest stalks. That's exactly what we're looking for here. Just right here. With a straight line. to the dart shot is a real art form. That is difficult. There it is. Push the dart down into a piece of paint and see if I can get that target with it over there. Fantastic. Can't watch that and not watch that we're going to have a go. It seems extraordinary now that the Cherokee shared their skills and land with the first settlers. <laughs> <laughs> but in the early 1800s, it must have seemed like there were riches enough for everyone in these mountains. <laughs> well, last night, the heavens absolutely opened. There was lightning throughout the sky. And the result, the woods today are a humid and a very sticky place. But I love it because it's that moisture that makes this forest grow. And places like this make me feel as though I'm coming alive. It's so rich in here, it's astonishing. But to the early pioneers who came here, this was a fairly dark and foreboding wilderness. Without science to explain the mysteries they were encountering, they turned to the obvious source of reference the scriptures. What was home to the Cherokee 
was an alien and scary land for the settlers. Their trepidation was clear from the names they gave the places. Blood Mountain, Devil's Creek Gap, Abram's Falls. The local wildlife was deeply unnerving. This wildlife biologist, Thomas Floyd, is about to show you. Thomas, tell me you've had some luck. I have. Tell what I think it is. It's a mud dog, a mud dog, a devil dog. Is that a hellbender? It is a hellbender. They've got some horrible names, haven't they? It's not our reason. God, let's have a look. That's incredible. Wow. This is an animal that I never thought I would see in my life. Because it's really rare. It is incredibly rare. It requires clear, clean flowing waters. Um, human activity has introduced a lot of soil and a lot of streams. Tell me how it lives. It's a salamander, but it is completely aquatic. It lives its entire life in streams that are cool, fast flowing. It's a predator, is that right? That's right. It will uh, take on about anything it can fit its mouth. And when people first saw this, what did they think about it? Well, they thought it was hideous because it lived under rocks in the streams. They thought maybe it was clawing its way back to hell. It's the name. It's the name. I find it difficult to understand the mindset that saw this harmless little creature as the work of the devil. So you're measuring the width of the tail, is that a sign of health? That's a sign of health. I think they're quite, quite charming really, aren't they? They really don't deserve all the nasty names over here. Let's go back on. Now, Europeans would never have seen creatures like this. There's the waves of religious exiles landing on these shores. The Puritans, the Catholics, the Baptists, and the Mormons. The scriptures colored their entire view of this land. The atmosphere here is so magical, it's not hard to see why the settlers overcame their unfamiliarity and started to make their homes. Oh, this is beautiful. Barbara Woodall can trace her roots back to the earliest pioneers. She has devoted her life to preserving those times. Life was simple here. It's hard to oh. They lived off the land. They were humble people. I mean, there's a real sense of uh, identity here, isn't there, to be Appalachian? Well, I say that my heart is knitted to these mountains with gold and thread that will never rust. That's a beautiful place, yeah. that's for sure. You get to see the mountains change different colors. Every season, every turn has a new surprise or a new blessing. Well, when the settlers came here, it must have been a bit mysterious for them. And it's, you know, as we as you come further south, there were more plants, strange yes. things. Here. Yes, they were. Thankfully, the Cherokee Indians were here, and they had grand knowledge of herbs and stuff, and they taught the settlers. They had a wonderful relationship between the Cherokee and white settlers, like, for instance, this is sweet birch, and she's for many things. It has the aspirin compound in it. You know, you could treat pain with it. But mostly, we used it, you know, for like a chewing gum, stuff like that. Can we find some shelter on the building? It might melt. <laughs> By the early 1800s, there were thousands of families like Barbara's pushing west as the Appalachians, Scottish, Irish, Germans, and English found plenty of good land to come alongside the Cherokee. This is a wonderful place, and I love these buildings. Fantastic. Paint a picture of what life would have been like. Well, you'd have had uh, somebody up there plowing that garden, you know, you'd hear the wheel on the old west mill and running and producing cornmeal for the community, sights and sounds around the farm. They played bluegrass music, you know, and all my dad would play the mandolin. But they were not all of the time to play because, quite, quite frankly, if you didn't know it, you didn't have it. Very soon, the emerging nation demanded the rich resources of these mountains, the timber, the land, 
and soon would go on for themselves. In 1838, after many years of happy coexistence, the federal government ordered the forcible removal of the Cherokee people. 